so, um, the last week or so, uh, two weeks maybe, my iPad has been breaking. And I think it might actually be broken. So I'm scrambling. Like, they, when I first started preaching with an iPad, I was told to always bring, like, a hard copy of it with you because you can never trust technology completely. And I did that for a little while, but then I just stopped because it always worked. It's not always working. So uh, I'm using the laptop tonight because I didn't print out a hard copy. I was too busy printing out the song sheets because they were 15 years away. But if you have a Bible or a device or a scripture notebook, go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to be in verses 17 through 24 tonight. And it's great to have you with us as we continue our time of worship tonight. We're worshiping in the Word. Like we don't, it's not like we worship and then we preach. It's, this is the entire thing that we do tonight. It's a pledge of our devotion in an act of worship of King Jesus. So Ephesians chapter 4, as we continue to study, we're going to be in Ephesians through the rest of the year with maybe two Sunday, uh, Saturday evenings where we're not in the book of Ephesians. Um, and we're really going to see this consistent theme. We've started to see the last few weeks where Paul has turned the corner in this book, and he's pointing us to how we live. He says, all right, I've poured out this incredible theology on you, but all theology needs to make a claim on your life. Because remember for Paul, and really the rest of the Bible, all of the Bible, in the last 2,000 years of church history, there is, there's no category for a belief that doesn't, at some level, translate into an action. Like, belief, how, how I say it is that it starts in the head, works to the heart, and then makes it to our hands. Because at some level, for every time you see the word believe in the Bible, there always would be an action expected behind it. And for the last 2,000 years in the church, that's kind of how we need to understand the word belief. And Paul's talking to them. He's saying, look, your beliefs need to be com convictional as they work out. You know, they start in that, in that mind, in the, in the intellect, and then they work out into our emotions, and then our emotions work into actions. And that's for... That truth isn't just for, like, me and Jesus. That truth isn't just for, like, me and Victoria. It's not even just for, like, me, Victoria, and our kids. That truth is for the church as well. There is a church, a, a corporate dynamic to the fact that our beliefs need to work out in action. There's absolutely a corporate dynamic here. So the main idea for us tonight, like, super simple... And you're going to be like, Paul, did you go to seminary? And I say, yeah, I did. Um, super simple. Main idea tonight. And we don't have books on the screen, but if you want to write it down, write it down. Four words. How we live matters. How we live matters. Super simple. We could, sorry, this stupid computer is doing something different for me now. Um, let's see if it's going to advance. So, it, it, just, just so we think about that clearly, like when I say how we live matters, again, not just me, not just our own families under our roof, but as a church and as larger groups of church, how we live matters. And we almost like we want to think about this as concentric circles, that how we live matters between me and Jesus absolutely matters. And then I use that to fuel how I love and serve my wife. And then I use how I love and serve and serve my wife to fuel how I love and serve and provide for my children and then to the church. So I think about moving from concentric circles as we think about how we live matters. So Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 24 says this, Therefore, I say this in testifying the Lord, you should no longer walk as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their thoughts. They are darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, and because of the hardness of their hearts. They became callous and gave themselves over to promiscuity for the practice of every kind of impurity with a desire for more and more. But that is not how you came to know Christ, assuming that you heard about him and were taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. To take off your former way of life, the old self, that is corrupted by deceitful desires, to be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and to put on the new self, the one created according to God's likeness, in righteousness and purity of 
of the truth. Let me pray for us as we look at these words. Heavenly Father, you are good and you are gracious and we love you and we trust you. Father, I pray that your word would penetrate our hearts tonight. Father, that we would grow in our affection for you and grow in our desire to live lives that honor you. In Jesus' name. Amen. So the, the first thing, we look at these verses from 17 to 24, like eight verses. The first thing I want us to see is that this is super important to Paul. Like, it's right there in verse 17, the first line. He's, this is so incredibly important to them. He says, therefore, I say this and testify in the Lord. Now, if somebody with the authority of the Apostle Paul, the greatest missionary that ever walked the planet, other than King Jesus himself, says to you, Therefore, I say this and testify in the Lord. Like he's saying, you need to listen. We need to listen. And remember, he's writing to a church and he's saying, church, you need to listen. In the name of Jesus, he's employing his God-given authority. And he, right after he calls them to operate as one body, using their gifts to build up one another, right after he says, you know, all the things that were dividing you are no longer important. Because Jesus is the great unifier. He said, now, now listen up. He wants them to pay complete and total attention to what he has to say. It's not like he just woke up one morning and said, oh, it'd be cool if I wrote them about, you know, living differently. Well, that, 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 that man, we make the New York Times bestsellers. <laughs> it's not like he just woke up and just had this flippant thought about how they live. Like, he was begging them, commanding them, testifying to what the Lord would want of his church. And what he would want from all of us who claim to be Christians. See, Jesus makes demands on our life. Like, we call him Lord. That means he sets the agenda. Period. And there ain't no room for it. It's not a negotiation. Like parents, you ever been with your kids and they try to negotiate with you? And you're like, this ain't no negotiation. Like, I pay all the bills. You're going to do what I say. Like, this ain't no negotiation. I pay all the bills. Like, you can eat what I tell you to eat. Like, everything in this house is because we love you. But we're not going to negotiate. Like, I have a negotiator in my family, and I love this child dearly. But sometimes i got to remind him that we live in a benevolent dictatorship in our home. Oh, and he's pointing at He's trying to <laughs> Sorry, when I said him, I guess I spoiled it. <laughs> like, this, he, he, Paul's not negotiating with them. And when we come to follow Jesus, like, we don't negotiate, we don't, we don't come and, like, make a deal with Jesus. Like, the deal is, you're dead and you're sitting in your trespasses, and he offers us life as we repent and believe him, and then, and then whatever he says, we say yes. But that's the deal. You get life. You get Jesus. You get meaning and purpose. How we live now. So Paul wants them to, to hear like the weight of his words when he says, I'm testifying to what the Lord wants this church to do, what the Lord wants for all of us who claim to be Christians to do. And in a nutshell, he says, your life should look differently than others. So point number two, be different. Be different. He says, therefore, I say this and testify in the Lord. You should no longer walk as the Gentiles do. No longer walk as the Gentiles do. See, for the Apostle Paul, there's two groups of people. Those who, by grace through faith, have believed in Jesus and everyone else. That's it. There are two groups of people. Those who have found life in Jesus' name and everyone else. And so when he uses the word Gentiles here, he's talking about the everyone else. He's like, your life should be different than all of them out there. Because they don't know Jesus. They've never been saved by Jesus. They've never tasted and seen that he is good and that he is worthy of all of our devotion and all of our affection and all of our obedience. He said, don't walk as the Gentiles do. Now, it's, it's really important. Like, we can almost just kind of lose sight of this. But it would be, like, Ephesus was a major city. It was a major port city, a major center of commerce in the first century. So Ephesus was a melting pot of cultures. Like uh, Miami, like if you do business in Miami, you got to do international business unless you like building 
houses or something, or doing some kind of trade like a plumber. But Miami is a set is a mecca of international business, right? And Miami has a, a large Cuban American uh, contingent, has a large South American contingent, but it also has a lot of European business. It has a lot of North American business. Miami is like a, a, a melting pot for international business. Now, with the internet, it's not always a melting pot of people coming in. With all kinds of technology, it's not this massive melting pot of influence. But imagine, go back 2,000 years ago, where you're a central port, port, you're a center of commerce, all kinds of people have to come through you and trade their goods and services. Right? It makes for an interesting city. It also makes for all kind of crazy religious practices. All kind of crazy stuff was happening. And there was all kind of crazy pagan activity happening because it was a port city. Like, what happens in Ephesus stays in Ephesus until it doesn't. And if you remember, like, they had such an impact that the silversmiths that were making idols for all these travelers that needed a new idol got mad and tried to chase out Paul and his boys out of the city. Like they had this massive, massive influence there. In Ephesus, like when the church says you should no longer walk like the Gentiles do, they, he, they knew exactly who Paul was talking about. All them folks out there. All that pagan wickedness that we see in our lives right in front of us every day. All that crazy stuff happening. And he says, look, Everyone else are Christians. There's two groups, and how we as Christians live matters. He says, be different. And he gives this progression. He talks about the futility of their thoughts. He says, and the futility of their thoughts. He's calling them. He said, he said they're focused on the wrong things, and their thoughts are futile. Like, they're focused on the wrong things. Totally missed it. This meaningless, self-centered nonsense. They're aiming at a meaningless goal, is what one author I read this week said. To aim at a meaningless goal. Their thoughts are futile. They're never satisfied, never content, always searching. Just blink your eyes if you know somebody that's like that. Right? Never content. Always searching. Focusing on a meaningless goal. Another, another author I read this week called this a, a self-centered emptiness. The futility of their thoughts. He says they're darkened in their understanding. They are excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. Hardness of hearts. We see similar language in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 verses 19 through 24. It says since what can be known about God is evident among them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, that is his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen since the creation of the world, being understood through what he has made. As a result, people are without excuse. What Paul is saying is that just look in the stars of the sky and you have to see that there is a God. There is a God, there is a creator, and you and I are not him. He says, for though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or show gratitude. Instead, their thinking became worthless. That's that futility of thoughts. And their senseless hearts were dark. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. And exchanged the glory of the mortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, four-footed animals, and reptiles. Therefore, God delivered them over in the desire of their hearts. The hardness of heart is real. Like, you get a tolerance for sin. Just like you can get a tolerance for alcohol, you can get a tolerance for food, you can get a tolerance for smoking marijuana, or whatever, whatever it is. Like, just pick a vice. You can develop, build up a tolerance for it. I have a, an extremely high tolerance for strong, dark coffee. My favorite food group right behind Hot Now Krispy Kreme. Like, there, you, you build up a tolerance for things. And just like we can build up a tolerance, like I remember one time I thought a double quarter pounder was a big 
cheeseburger. I, that used to be a big cheeseburger. Now I want the triple double quarter. You know, like you get a tolerance for things. We all understand what I'm talking about. You can get a tolerance for sin. And that's how our hearts can become hardened. And that's what it happened to out there. That's what's happening to our loved ones that don't know Jesus. That's what's happening to our neighbors that don't know Jesus. That's what's happening to our friends and our family that we care for deeply that have never turned from their sin and trusted in Jesus. Every time they're building the towers a little higher, a little higher, a little higher. Just ask a kid, you know, the first time you tell a lie as a kid, you might not sleep that night. Right? The first time you tell a lie, like, you, I'm going to get caught. I told mom I got an 87 when I really got a 77. I'm going to get caught. Right? Like, you might not sleep at night, but then that second time you tell a lie, you get nervous just for a second. And then that third time you tell a lie, you become natural. You get a hardness of heart. You build up tolerance. We should never let sin break into our lives. We should never think of sin like trying to break in a new pair of shoes. I had this pair of shoes that gave me a massive blister. When I worked, worked at the banks, I had this sharp pair of shoes that gave me a massive blister. And I wore them anyway, and every time I wore them, they hurt a little bit less. A little bit less. A little bit less. Like every time we go to that website that we shouldn't go to, it hurts a little less. It stings a little less. Every time we take advantage of our employer, the Lord, we should take advantage of it. hurts a little less. It hurts a little less. But see, when we grow a tolerance for the sting of sin, when sin stops uh, stinging us in our conscience, that's how we can become hardened of heart. Because that sting, that hurt, that nervousness of sin is there for a reason. It's to lead us to repentance. God doesn't want us to be comfortable with sin. Calluses develop through pain. Calluses develop through pain. It says they became, because the hardest of the hearts, they became callous. They became callous. Like calluses develop through pain, which means, like, what if we just stopped when it hurt? Oh, that's no pain, no gain, right? No, let's just stop when it hurts. That sting of sin which is written in our hearts, that's the moral law of God that people ignore until the sting stops and becomes callous. And when sin stops, I knew I was going to mess this up. When sin stops stinging, I tried to say that ten times really fast in the mirror tonight. I said tonight in the mirror when you're going to bed, buddy, appreciate your participation. But when sin stops stinging, we give ourselves over to it. We have given ourselves over to it. Paul uses the phrase promiscuity. He's just talking about every kind of impurity with a desire for more and more, a desire and appetite that is unquenched. So here's the thing. Like, it's easy to think about all those folks out there. It's easy to think about all those wicked people. But can I just tell you that apart from Jesus, even the best of people are evil. Like the nice little old lady that waves to you always when you drive into the neighborhood that has no interest in the things of God, she's evil and wicked. Dead in her sin and trespass. Even though she's super nice. Because there really only are two groups of people. Remember, Paul is absolutely concerned with everyone knowing that there are two groups of people. Those that believe in Jesus and everyone else. Those that have repented and trusted in Jesus are trusting in Jesus and everyone else. And then Paul gives the contrast. He says in verse 20, but that's not how you came to know Christ. But that's not how you came to know Christ. That's relational language. He doesn't say, but that's not how you came to know all the rules. He's like, yeah, he also doesn't say, but that's not how you came to know this, that, that. He's pointing us to a relationship with Jesus that starts in a moment, continues for life. It's relational language, but that's not how you came to 
know Christ. A person. To know a person. This is what you've learned of him through the pages of this book. What you've learned of him through the church. What he has taught you by his spirit and his word. How he has been absolutely, totally trustworthy and faithful even when you were at your worst. What, how he has always protected you even when you weren't worthy of being protected. That's not how you came to know Christ. Assuming you heard about him and were taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. And he talks about this undeniable life change. See, when we come to know Jesus, when we trust in him, when we surrender our lives to him, it comes with this undeniable life change. And that's point number four to write down if you're taking notes. And you don't know for. The undeniable life change. When we actually come to know Jesus, we surrender our lives to him when we trust him completely. He says to take off your former way of life, the old self that is corrupted by deceitful desires, to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, the one created according to God's likeness and righteousness and purity of the truth. See, to take off the old self, it's the imagery of changing clothes, like Take it all off, take because it it's completely defective. We, 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 we strip down and put something fresh on. Absolutely, totally defective. When I was a kid, I think I've told this before. When I was a kid, on my 14th birthday, I got a job at McDonald's. And it was awful. <laughs> and I worked off and on there through high school. <coughs> Terrible place to work. <coughs> uh, I mean, I'm sure they've changed, whatever, like, what, if you work there. I heard the other day said like one out of eight people who work at McDonald's, but I, I don't believe that statistic. I don't know. Um, but I worked at McDonald's, and I decided that they, they offered me an apron, but I thought, well, that's just one more thing I got to wash and make sure it's clean. <laughs> so I just used my shirt and my pants as an apron. And so I would work the Saturday morning breakfast shift sometimes, and they had me on the little griddles. Because that was before everything was like pre-cooked or whatever. We actually had to whip the eggs. I learned how to crack eggs with both hands, one hand at a time as a teenager. Totally awesome. Um, that has nothing to do with the, that. Has nothing to do with that. But especially on Saturday mornings. Because I, I, I couldn't work Sunday mornings. I was always going to church. I could go to work after church, but I was not going to work Sunday mornings. Couldn't work Monday through Friday because of school. But I would work every Saturday morning. I, I always had the breakfast shift. And... You get eggs all over your hands. And I didn't use an apron because that was one more thing to wash. So I was just, just I, I mean, I had caked egg all over, like from the middle of my chest to my knees, just all over, all over. And those clothes smelled so awful, so awful, that like the house we lived in, you walked into the garage through, and then you walked in through the laundry room. Like I had to strip down before I came in the house. It smelled so awful. And, what was really awesome, too, is if I got to, to rehydrate the dehydrated onions, those tiny little onion pellets, those are dehydrated. They come in a pack. You rip it open. You dump them. And you soak them in water to rehydrate them. So if I got to do that after I had been cooking eggs all morning, man, that smelled great. Those clothes, like my mother didn't want those clothes entering into her house because there was something completely and totally defective. With them. That's how we are. This undeniable life changes when we take off the clothes. Like, but the difference is that like my mom can get my uniforms clean. Jesus isn't asking us to try to clean our uniforms. He's giving us a whole new set of clothes. He said, you need to take that off because it's absolutely defective. I need you to put this new one on. And the moment we confess faith in Christ, the moment we turn to him, we ask him to forgive us, we commit our life to him. That is the moment that this undeniable life change happens. We take off the old self that has been corrupted with deceitful desires. And here's the rub. Like, deceitful desires. Deceitful desires. Like, in our cultural moment, even just using the phrase deceitful desires makes you intolerant and a bigot. It means you're hating someone if you say anyone's desire is deceitful. 
if we use that word. But that's what the book says. And that's what we're to take off, our deceitful desires. We live in a moment where we're encouraged to embrace every desire with no examination if that desire is good, with no examination if that desire brings honor and glory to God. The logic works something like this. I want something. My desires can't be wrong because God, if God is real, he must want me to be happy. So it is good and right for me to run after every single desire I have because that's the only way I can be free, the only way I can be happy, whether it's food or money or more and better stuff or job success or relationships or school or sex or work or whatever. Our cultural moment says if you desire it, your desires are good and run after them. Can I tell you that's a lie straight out of the pit of hell? Like most of our desires are deceitful. It's, and this idea that we just run after every desire that we have, every desire that we want, but it's idolatrous because it makes your desires ultimate. And it takes Jesus off the throne. Like we can't have Jesus on the throne and chase after everything that he says is not good or God honoring. We can't. Because if he is Lord, he calls all the shots. Remember, it's not like me and Dylan negotiating tonight. Like, Jesus is not going to negotiate with us. He says, you're in or you're out. And if you're in, think hard. It's going to cost you something. But it's going to be so worth it. He even, he even told people to think. Think about it. Think about it. We live in a cultural moment that says, that exalts ourselves, but Christianity at its core is this long and beautiful road of self-denial. Self-denial. Jesus said, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take this cross daily and follow after me. Our culture says, you be you, do what you want, when you want it, buy what you want, when you want it, sleep with who you want, whenever you want it. Jesus says, come to me, <clears throat> deny yourself, follow me, and you'll find meaningful freedom and purpose in life. This undeniable change. Undeniable change you come to know Jesus. You put on the new self. That change happens in a moment. It continues for a lifetime. It doesn't happen <coughs> perfectly. We get that new set of clothes. But you know what? We might not realize when you wear a sport coat, you don't button both buttons. You know, come on, let's laugh. Right? Like, we, might not, we might need to learn how to tie the tie or tie our shoes. You know what I'm saying, right? Because it's, it's a, it, it, the imagery really is a change of clothes. But like, we still have to learn how to use it, how to embrace that new life. It doesn't mean that we're perfect, but we've got a new set of clothes on. Here's what, you, here's what Paul would write in your Bible, like six pages to your right in your Bible in the book of Colossians. It says, therefore, put to death what belongs to your earthly nature. Sexual immorality, purity, lust, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, God's wrath is coming on the disobedient. And you once walked in these things when you were living in them, but now put away all the following. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and filthy language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old self with his practices and have put on the new self. You are being renewed in knowledge according to the image of your creator. Put on the new self, one that is absolutely consumed by the goodness and greatness of Jesus. One that's committed to killing the sinful desires in our life. Can I just tell you, like, if I was willing, if I was able to run after the sinful desires in my life, I would sleep at least 10 hours a day. And every day would be filled with hot now Krispy Kremes. I'd drive a fancy sports car, but I'd have to build a lift into it to lift me out of it. Everything hurts from the lower back down. And, you know, I'm thoroughly middle aged, so everything hurts. But instead, we need to be committed to killing the sinful desires that are in our life and find our greatest joy in Jesus. It says one that is created in God's likeness and righteousness and purity of truth. How, 
how do we allow our minds to be renewed? Through the Word of God. Individually, through the Word of God. In families, through the Word of God. In the church context. Our minds will not be renewed apart from the Word of God. Because God has given us book. We fill our minds with the truth of God's Word. And we allow Jesus to change our desires. I tell you, the things that I wanted in 20 are wildly different than the things I wanted in 46. Make it more personal. The things I wanted at 40 wildly different than the things I wanted in 46. By God's grace, they are wildly different. As Jesus changes my desires, he can do that for you too. The renewed mind allows us to see God's truth. To understand our desires through the lens of God's good design. The renewed mind allows God to change us to make us who He wants us to be. Because how we live matters. Going back to that main idea how we live matters. And Paul had two groups of people, and I just wondered tonight which group are you in? Are you one with renewed mind, renewed hearts, with that new set of clothes? Or you like one of the Gentiles? If you if you think you're like one of the Gentiles, and I just tell you, turn to Jesus right now. Ask him to save you. I promise you, you will. Tell him you, you need his forgiveness and you want this new life that he alone can offer. That starts in a moment, continues for life. Right now. It's how we live matters. For those that would say, yes, I'm in that renewed mind group, I'm in that group, and I just encourage you, like, we don't need to be cool or relevant, we need to be different. We don't need to be cool or relevant, we don't need to prove anything to anyone, because Jesus has proven it all for you. We just need to be different. Live our lives as if this book is real and true. How we befriend people at school, how we treat our kids. How we treat our spouses, our parents, and our friends. How we work at our jobs. How we neighbor in our communities. How we serve one another in the church. Let's let others see the truthfulness and the beauty of the gospel by what we say, how we live, and what we say. Let's fight the sin in our own lives with the truth of God's word, and let's help those around us fight. Just like a couple weeks ago when I said we need to work good. Paul said, walk worthy of your calling. And I don't know if you remember this. I said, sometimes we need to help the person next to us walk. Sometimes we also need to help the people next to us fight the sin in their own lives. And we need to trust that they're going to help us fight it in our lives. We need to help and allow ourselves to do that. Let's pray. Father, you are good, you are gracious, and loving gift of Jesus.